We've been talking the past few weeks about how God created us in his image. To look like him, to act like him, to walk like him, to be like him, to, to live for eternity like him. And yet, what did we just sing? What did he make us of, out of? Dust. The stuff we try to get out of our houses, right? The stuff we, we spray and dust that stuff away and sweep and vacuum and try to get rid of all that dirt. He made us out of dirt. And so what, what hope do we have? We're made out of dirt. Good grief. We're made out of the stuff that we try to get out of our houses. And so we're all a mess, aren't we? It's been a hard week, hasn't it? This world's in a mess. Our country's in a mess. Our country is falling apart, it feels like sometimes. We suffered two shootings, two killings earlier in the week. Things that from the videotapes that just looks wrong, doesn't it? The truth is we don't know what was happening there. We don't know all the details because we weren't there. We see one perspective from a video camera, but we just, but, but from that viewpoint, it just looks wrong. And then we have a retaliation shooting. And five policemen are dead. Five policemen who are trying to do the right thing. And they paid with their lives. Other shootings have been happening this week. Other protests. Our country seems to be dividing over all kinds of things. But our racial divides, our political divides, the canyon just seems to be getting deeper and deeper and wider across, doesn't it? That we are pulling apart at the seams and we're pointing fingers at each other and we're looking at each other and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm right. And, we, and the canyon gets wider and wider and deeper and deeper. And that's what happens. Solomon talks about what happens under the sun. He says, under the sun... In this world, things go awry. Nothing works out right. But in God's eternal plan, things do work out right. But we see that people who live their lives as though this was all there is, we do divide, we break up, we split. And the church is different than that, isn't it? Isn't it? We don't divide, do we? We don't point fingers at each other, do we? What? What are you giggling about? It's because you know that we do, don't we? You look across this community and you see all these different churches all over the place. And we all used to be one. We came from the same place. And now we're all split up in different places. Can you imagine there being one church in Murrieta where everybody met? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a good thing we have all these different churches, isn't it? Because if we all met in one place, it would be huge. But the reasons that we're divided are sad. It's because we disagree with each other and then we, then we figure out, since I disagree with you, then I can't live with you. I can't worship with you. I can't work with you. I can't even sometimes love you. We don't say it that way, but we act that way. And then even in our own churches, we're still a mess. We're made of dirt. We're made in God's image. We're made to live in his image and to show his image. But we have a hard time doing that, don't we? It is something we need to be at work on. <clears throat> I don't know about you. I've been sad this week. With just the things that are going on in this country. <clears throat> I'm not even going to speak about some of them. But we can talk later. But the divisions and the hope that we have in this country seem to be getting dim. But the church is the answer to this country's problems. God said that he marveled when he looked at Israel 
and all the problems that were going on in Israel, and as they were leaving God further and further behind, God said, I marveled that I found no one who was standing up to pray, to intercede for these people. God was looking for somebody to stand in the gap and pray for his people. Now you want to thank God, if you want your people to be one, why are you waiting for somebody to pray for it? Just do it. You can do it. You're God, right? But he says, I'm waiting for somebody to step in and take the action to care enough to pray for these people. To speak their name. But instead the people continue to point fingers at each other. And they continue to divide. If you remember your biblical history, you'll know that after the Israelites came into the promised land, God gave them this land. They lived there for a while and then they wanted a king and so God gave them a king. Saul was their first king. David was the second king. Solomon was the third king. They expanded the kingdom. It was a great place. But after Solomon, Solomon's son became king, Rehoboam, and he was a harsh king and the people rebelled and divided God's kingdom into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And they never came back together. And the northern tribe that split off never had a godly king, ever. And they dove into idolatry and all kinds of things, things of the world, and God eventually destroyed them. He punished them all along the way. He disciplined them. He put hardship on them to call them back. But sometimes they prospered. But even in their prosperity, they were doing wicked things. Jeroboam the second, Jeroboam the first was the one who broke off and split the, the, the kingdom. But Jeroboam the second, several years later, was one of the mightiest kings of the northern tribes. And he restored the borders. However, the Bible says he was a wicked king. He did not follow in the paths of God. He followed in the paths of his evil fathers. And yet God still blessed the people because he made a promise to them to be their protector. But all the while, there was a prophet who was speaking into Jeroboam's ear. <clears throat> you know this prophet for something else. But he was trying to lead this nation of Israel back to God. His name was Jonah. And Jonah was speaking into Jeroboam's ear all the time saying, Jeroboam, turn back to God. Follow God's ways. And Jeroboam refused to listen. But now step down the road a couple of steps. And let's take a look at Jonah. This man who is trying to call the kingdom back to God trying to instruct the king in which way he should go, trying to remind the people about what was right, God called him and said, Jeroboam, not Jeroboam, Jonah, I've got a, I've got a task for you. I'm going to send you to the great city of Nineveh. You're supposed to go, ooh, ah. <laughs> or you can go, You've ever been in those melodramas where you, you cheer the, the hero and you hiss at the villain? <clears throat> when you say Nineveh, you can go, hiss, hiss, and you kiss, because they're the bad guys. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian nation who was oppressing Israel. They would come in time and time again. They would kill the people. They would destroy their crops. They would leave them penniless and, and without any food, and the people were starving to death. They would take over their cities, they'd burn their houses, they'd kill their children, and God says, I want you to go to those people and tell them to repent because if they don't, I'm going to kill them. And Jonah is thinking, wait a minute, those are our enemies, God. Those are the enemies. He just said, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, says, go. Go, Jonah, to the great city of 
Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And Jonah's thinking, uh, uh, yeah, they're a wicked city, God. Remember what Jonah had been doing up to this point? He'd been talking into the ear of the wicked king of Israel. And then he points at the finger at Nineveh and says, they're wicked, God. <laughs> you see the irony of the little... I don't know. I think it's kind of funny. Jonah said no to God and he ran away. And he headed for Tarshish and he went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the ferry, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. We're not exactly sure where Tarshish is, but we believe it's in Spain. It's as far away as he could get from Nineveh. But you know the story, if you remember anything about Jonah. He got out there on the, sh on the ocean, and God sent this big storm, and the sailors are scared to death. Jonah's sleeping underneath the deck, and they come to him and say, wake up. Pray to your God. We're all praying to our gods. We are going to die unless somebody intervenes. So maybe your God will listen to you. And of course, the storm got worse. And so the sailors had this great idea. We'll find out whose fault this is. Who on this ship has sinned so great? And so they cast lots. And the lot fell to Jonah. So they looked at him. What are you doing? Why are you here? What is the problem? And Jonah said, I'm running away from my God. <laughs> You're doing what? And he's going to kill all of us because of you. Well, that's what Jonah said. If you don't throw me over, all of us will die. Well, these ungodly men did the right thing. They tried to save Jonah. They tried to save this one who's bringing this calamity on all of them. But it was to no avail. The storm just got worse. So they prayed. And they said, God, don't hold this against us. The death of this man. And then they threw him over. And immediately the sea got calm. And it says those men were scared and they were witnesses to God's power. But God had prepared this mighty fish to swallow Jonah. For three days he was in the belly of this fish as his heart was changing. But you know how his heart changed? <clears throat> it wasn't toward the Ninevites. It was toward God. To where he said, God, okay, okay, I get it. This is the paraphrased edition now. He says, I get it. You are God. I'm Jonah. <laughs> I'll do what you say. I may not like it, but I'll do what you say. And so he went to Nineveh. The, the fish spit him up on the land. He went to Nineveh. He marched through this mighty city. It said it took three days to walk across the city. He preached to the city, and he preached a message that he loved. He says, God's going to kill you in 40 days. You're going to be wiped out unless you repent. <laughs> but you're going to be wiped out. He loved that part of the story, unless you repent. And after he did, he preached that, everybody listened to him, even up to the king of Nineveh. And these were wicked people. The stories they're told about the citizens of Nineveh are horrifying. And yet they repented even up to the king himself. And God relented from his punishment. So you know what Jonah did? He was so mad. He said, God, I knew you'd do this. I knew you're a God of compassion. I knew you're a God of patience. I knew if I preached to him, you wouldn't kill him. <laughs> The more we learn about Jonah, the less we like him, don't we? What do you see in this guy? This guy who's trying to whisper in the, or whisper, he's speaking in the ear of the king of Israel. To turn to God and follow him and be righteous in God's sight. And yet we see him on this hillside outside of Nineveh, angry at God because God was compassionate on these people. How did he look at these Ninevites? How did Jonah see them? He saw that they were a bunch of evil, 
no goods, enemies, people out to do harm to his people and his families, his loved ones, his nation, his everything that was precious to him. The Ninevites were out to destroy. They were his enemies. That's all he could see him as. And so we see in chapter 4 of Jonah, verse 5 through 11. He writes this. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and he sat in its shade. And he waited to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. We can understand that, can't we? When the thermometer hits about 110, 115, we want to be out of that sun, don't we? He was happy about that plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided, I love that word, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint and he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, yes, it is. I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Jonah's a good guy, isn't he? He's a prophet of God. But the Lord said to Jonah, Jonah, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. And the book of Jonah ends right there with that question. Jonah is so mad. He's mad at God for not killing these people. He's mad he has to stand here, sit here on this hillside and watch them be saved. And he's mad because the sun's beating on his head. And he's mad because the plant died and now he's uncomfortable. And he's mad because the wind is blowing. And he's, he's just mad. And God said, time out, Jonah. Who are these people? Here's 120,000 people who are walking in darkness. Here are 120,000 people that I love. Can you imagine that God loves your enemies? Think about it just a moment. Do you have enemies? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but go like this. <laughs> They might not be people who are out to kill you, but they might be. They might be people who are dividing your family. They might be people who are hurting your family. They might be people who are hurting you in your business. They might, who knows, there might be people who are your enemies who are just shoving you off the road. I mean, they're, they're not, I talked before about the maniacs and the morons on the roads, you know, the maniacs are the ones who are driving faster than you, the morons are the ones driving slower than you. This, it is, We've got people all around us who bug us, who cause us problems. And how does God look at those people? He says, these are the people that I love. These are the people I died for. So he says, Doug, how should you look at them? Jonah, how should you look at them? Why should you care for these people who you don't even know who aren't doing the right thing anyway? And he says, be careful to love them the way I love them. In our country, in our city, in our church, we have people that we disagree with. 
We have people that we don't understand. We have, and here's, here's a harder thing than just people, and here's a harder thing than just race. It's culture. People living in cultures that we just don't get. I don't get some cultures. Okay, I know a lot of you have tattoos. That's, all, fine. That's good. Go for it. I don't get it, though. I don't understand that culture. I don't want anybody sticking needles in my arm and painting things on there that someday are going to be saggy and baggy. And <laughs> I don't want that. And I, but can I love you anyway? Can you love me for in the, even though I don't understand it? Do I have to get tattoos before you can love me? I hope not. I hope we can be different in our cultures, different in our understandings, and still be God's people, united in Christ and not in our agreement on all of our cultural things. There are a lot of things I just don't get, but that doesn't mean I can't be God's person to love each other. And what God calls us to be in this world is to be made in his image, portraying his image to the rest of the world. So what kind of image do we portray when we walk out and we talk badly about other people? We talk badly about other groups of people? We talk badly about people within the, our own church? What happens when we talk about our president? I tell you what, I'm not real happy with this president, but I'll tell you something else. Not real happy with our previous president either. And I'm not real happy with the president before him either. As a matter of fact, there's a whole line of presidents <laughs> that I'm not too happy with. How do I need to speak about them? How do I need to portray Christ to the rest of the world? Here's what Paul said. In Ephesians 4.29, and I've emphasized this verse a lot of times. It's saved me so many times before I speak. He says, don't let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth, but only those words that build people up and give them grace. Only say things that build other people up. What would this be like? What would this church would be like? What would this world be like if that's what we all did is always to build somebody else up. That would be good. But instead, we, sometimes we pick at each other, we look at each other, we see differences and we see disagreements and so we pull those out and that is not godly. Jonah was looking at these Ninevites through his worldly eyes and he was having a hard time looking at them through God's eyes. And God's explained to him that, Jonah, I made these people I am grieved that they're walking away from me. I'm grieved that they don't know me. Can't you be grieved with me? Can't you share in my heart and my love for these people? No, God, they're my enemies. They hurt my family. They hurt my nation. But Jonah... Oh, you say, oh, he's, he's about to mention that, that F word. You know that F word. <clears throat> when it starts F-R-O-G-I-V-E. Guess spell? It's one of the hardest words that we deal with as people, learning how to forgive our enemies, learning how to forgive those people who have really hurt us, learning how to forgive people who don't deserve forgiveness. Except when I realize that like Jonah, who was back in Israel, talking to the king who didn't deserve forgiveness either, who was being wicked and saying, God, help this nation. I don't deserve forgiveness either. And yet God has been kind to me. And God has been kind to you. And so what do we do with this? Here's what John said. 
First John chapter four, verse 19, he says, we love because he first loved us. We love because God showed us what love was like. We love not because we deserve God's love, but he chose to love us. And whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen, and he has given us his command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. But you don't know what they've done to me. You don't know what they're still doing to me. How can you love somebody who's always in your face or always talking about you behind your back or always hurting the people you love? How can you love somebody who is always sticking it to you How can you love somebody? And we start asking all these questions and making excuses. But what does God say? And now it comes down to the, to the, to the brass tacks. Do I believe him? Do I follow him? Or do I just kind of on my head and say, well, that's a good idea, God. Or do I do what he says? Really chilling in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus gives them the model prayer. The disciples say, Jesus teaches how to pray. And he says, here's how you do it. But he gets to the end of the prayer and he says, one of the verses, lines, he says, and Father, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And then he says, for if you forgive people, other people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins either. Those, that's a hard teaching. But what happens if you just forgive somebody when they've hurt you? Won't they come back and do it again? Maybe. And what does he say about that? If he comes back and hits you again, knock him to the ground, right? What does he say? He says, turn the other cheek. But that doesn't make any sense at all to us, does it? Not on a human level. Not on an earthly, fleshly level. Turn the other cheek. Jesus, what are you? You don't understand. Until we watch what Jesus did. He stood before the Sanhedrin when they lied about him. And what did he do? When they beat him, when they slapped him, they hit him, they spit on him. What did he do? He turned another cheek. When they nailed him to the cross and he could have called down 10,000 angels and wiped out that city and started over, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. What if we as people, as God's people, acted that way with each other all the time? What if we were ready to forgive each other even though we might get hurt again? What if we forgave each other and loved each other and looked out for each other even though it meant risking something or giving up something or never, not getting even with somebody? Wow, this would be a different place. But I need to understand I'm a sinner just like everybody else. We're called to be one. If we wait, <clears throat> if we wait for our legislators in Washington to make enough rules to make this a good country, guess how long we're going to be waiting? Forever. Thank you. There is not enough paper and not, not enough ink in this world to write the number of laws that are going to make people be right. Paul spoke to the Colossian church. He says, you guys are practicing all these different things. You're you're trying to be pure by your own grit, but it's not doing anything 
to curb your natural tendencies towards sin. You have got something in your heart that is broken. Eric Garcetti the other day at the graduation service for the police academy, he said something good in his speech. And that's what he said. He said, in America, we've lost something. We've lost something precious that cannot be replaced by legislation. He didn't go on to say what that was. I'm not even sure he knows what it is. He just senses that loss. But it's a moral underpinning that says God is overall and I will be his regardless. I will value life even if they hurt me. I will turn the other cheek. I will honor God with my life by loving even my enemies. Because what happens when somebody hits you and you hit them back? What do they do? Oh, sometimes they can't get up. But, but let's say they do get up. They usually come back with something bigger, like maybe a bat. And they swing at you a bat, so what do you get? You get a bigger bat, right? Two or four. You get, and then they come back with a gun, and then you come back with a hand grenade, and pretty soon you've got a war on your hands. When we do things by a fleshly mindset, we just dig ourselves into a deep hole. But when we stop and love a person instead, enough to even sit down and listen to them and say, tell me what you're seeing here. Tell me what you're experiencing. Without coming back to them and saying, well, that's stupid. It's not that way. Wait, wait, wait. We stop and we listen. And we find out what, where other people are coming from because we care about those people, because they are precious in God's eyes. And he put us together as different people, all made out of dirt. To be one people united in Christ. To be a picture of salvation of this world. Here we are, dirt bags. Right? We don't deserve... God's love and his forgiveness but what has he done for us he has lavished his love on us so how do we act towards each other we act as dearly loved children brothers and sisters putting up with each other loving each other looking out for the good for each other and looking out for the good even of our enemies that God also loves we're called to be light in this world. We're called to be salt in this world. We're called to, to shine God's truth and we're called to make life tasty if you will to make it good for other people and it can't wait for Washington it's got to start with you it's got to start with me think for a second who's in your life that you need to forgive today is there a rift in a relationship someplace that needs to be healed? Could you forgive some rogue police officers? Could you forgive somebody who shoots up innocent people? Could you forgive the history of a nation and look at people instead? Can you forgive somebody even in your own family and look at them through God's eyes instead of your past with them? Could you look at somebody in your own church who maybe has said things about you or gone behind your back or, or just you just, they just got a viewpoint that you just can't buy into. Can you still love them and be united in Christ? God called together the Ephesian church of Jews and Gentiles who are a million miles apart in their understanding. And he said, understand this, 
I have broken down the barrier that kept you apart. And I've made you one. And there's only one Lord and one faith and one God and Savior of all. There's only one baptism. There's only one. And you're united in him. Can you get along in that? And cherish that? And build that? And we can go out in this world and be a picture to this world? And not wait for Washington to tell us what to do? But we can be an example of God's love and healing in this world? Let's pray. Father, you have loved us. <clears throat> when we didn't deserve to be loved... While we were still sinners, Father, you sent your son to die for us. How can we even contemplate? Can- Father, we are so amazed at your love and your patience and your mercy, and we thank you for it. Father, please help us to be a picture of that to the world, of your love and your mercy, of your body of holding together and all the different parts and all the different functions working together for your sake. Father, We can't do that on our own. We are a mess, and we need your strength. We need your wisdom. God, don't let us forget what you've done for us, but constantly remind us that you have loved us and called us dearly loved children when what we really deserve is to be apart from you forever. God, give us your eyes to see even our enemies. Give us your eyes to see them the way you see them and to love even our enemies. And Father, use us as a seed of peace and of light and joy in this world. Father, I pray that you would so live in us that other people would see you through us. And we praise your name because of what we do in your name, by your strength and by your power. God, glorify yourself through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song that says, Nearer, still nearer. Draw me, my Savior, close to you. Second verse of that song says, says, God, nearer, still nearer. But when I come to you nearer, I have nothing in my hands. Nothing in my hand do I bring to you. I don't deserve anything from you. I can't buy anything from you. I don't, there's no reason you should love me. But I come to you with a contrite heart, a broken heart, because I know I'm a mess. I know I'm full of sin. So love me. We come to him saying that, and he says, I do. And he opens his arms to us like the prodigal son who ran away and embarrassed his father and his family. And the father sat on his porch waiting for his son to come back. And when the son did, he opened his arms and welcomed him. And that's the picture of the father saying, I love you regardless. Just come to me. We're going to sing that song. And if you're ready to come to Christ today and give your life to him, be baptized into him, then come down here. But he says this too. He says, seek me and pray. He tells us, if you pray, I will hear your prayers and I will answer your prayers. I will respond to you because I love you and I want to be involved in your life. And so our elders are ready to sit down and pray with you and take the matters before you that you're dealing with to God. Let him be the strength. And so while we sing the song, nearer, still nearer, meet with our elders and draw near to God in prayer and take your cares to him. If you need either one of those, then do that while we stand and sing this song.